Hey everyone, this is Mathmetrics. Welcome to episode 10 of Mixing Loud with Clip to Zero. In this video, I'll explain how we use analog modeled plugins, also known as vintage plugins, in a CTZ project where the signals on every track and every bus are typically running much hotter than these vintage plugins want. Before I get into it, let me remind people that are dropping in on this video for the first time. This is part of an ongoing series called Mixing Loud with Clip to Zero. We're up to episode 10 now. There's a lot of episodes that came before this, and I assume you've seen these and are familiar with the concepts and techniques I've been talking about in these earlier videos. There's also a lot of episodes still coming. We're only right here in episode 10. I'm still gonna be covering about another 10 or 11 episodes. So if you wanna stay on top of those as they come out, be sure and subscribe to my channel and uh, you'll get notified when they come out. So let's get right into it. We're gonna demo this concept on a simple, boring drum track. And I'm using this one in particular because it has a pretty big woofy kick and snare and I can reshape it and show you that, you know, vintage plugins are having a certain effect. The thing is, as you can tell from looking at the waveform, I mean, this is really loud. This kick is right up to full scale and this second hit is the kick and snare combined. And uh, it's very, very loud. And analog modeled plugins, and what I mean by that are plugins like you know, tape saturation emulations or classic compressors like, you know, a Ure 1176. These kind of plugins, they're modeled after classic pieces of analog gear, and they were built for the analog world, which runs at a whole different signal level than we typically run in our DAWs, especially if you run clip to zero gain staging. So all of these plugins are modeled to behave like their famous analog counterparts. And it's very typical of a lot of, especially older analog gear, to have a sweet spot for how much, how hot the signal is you should run into them. If you run a signal that's too hot, too loud, they're not gonna respond the same way as if you run a signal in at the level they expect and want. And in the analog world, <laughs> There's lots of different measurements you hear about dBVU and some other measurements, but the bottom line is it tends to um, all, all center around generally negative 18 RMS on average. And every one of these analog modeled plugins has their own unique sweet spot and rules for like what is the optimum level to push into these plugins to get the desired famous response that they're known for, right? If you overheat them, push the signal too loud, you're not gonna get the thing that they were designed to give you. You're gonna get something a little weird. It's a little out of whack, right? So in any project, not just a loud clip to zero project, but in any project, these can be problematic to work with because, you know, unless you tend to work all the way down at negative 18 RMS on average, right? Pretty low gain staging. Uh, you put these in and you, you have to fiddle with them to get the signal dropped down to the right level or pushed up to the right level to hit them at their sweet spot. And then you've just changed the gain staging on a given channel or bus. And now that bus is out of whack with everything else in your mix. And you have to do something to compensate for that gain change you made. And it's no different in clip to zero. It's just we're running at a very hot loud signal on every track and bus right up against full scale in a small dynamic range. And so we have to use the standard trick everyone has always had to use to compensate for these vintage plugins. So I think the first thing I want to make clear, there's no magic here. There's nothing about what I'm going to show you that is specific to clip to zero. I don't care what gain staging you work at, you always have to handle these plugins this way. Okay, and if you haven't been, it's because you haven't thought about how these plugins work. So I'm gonna drag something out here to just kind of show you in one screenshot the basic process. It's a, it's a simple 
mechanical, very repeatable pattern you have to use when you're working with these things. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about putting one of these on a track or on a bus. It's the same exact approach and processing either way. So I'm going to drag this off screen and just talk you through it if you want. Go ahead and pause this video and make a screenshot or take notes or whatever. But I'm going to show you these steps step by step. It's a pretty simple process. Once you've done it once or twice, it's hard to forget, right? It's pretty common sense. So let's say, for example, we'll start out with um, this particular plugin. This is a tape saturation plugin. It is a vintage emulation of a couple famous, you know, tape machines like a Studer and uh, different tape formulations. And it, it imparts a kind of saturation, a kind of color saturation. And the thing to know about every vintage plugin is you, you better go read the manual. You have to read the manual to understand how to tell that you're putting the right amount of signal into it for its sweet spot. So it just so happens with this one, um, if we go to the manual, way down here on page 15, they talk about, well, you know, how hard should you hit the tape? How, how hot of a signal should you drive into this? And they say, well, use the VU meter that we put right there in the plug-in. And generally, you want your needle to be hitting very close to 0 dB VU. And this is common. A lot of these vintage plugins tend to work this way. And they give you a little meter to look at. And all you want to do is make sure the needle's roughly hitting around the zero range. It can go over. It can be under. Typically, maybe on the peaks, you want it to smack right in around zero. And if you're doing that, you're kind of at the originally designed and modeled input. Okay. Now, it has input volume knobs and output volume knobs. And by default, these are both at zero. And these invite you to just, you know, use the internal input and output controls to gain stage or balance your signal, right? But there's a more methodical way, a more repeatable way. And that's what I'm about to show you. I tend to leave these input and output knobs inside these kinds of plugins. I leave them alone and I drive them with uh, gain controls before and after the plugin itself. So let's do that. Here's the Virtual Tape Machines plugin right down here in my channel insert strip. And what I'm going to do is put in two instances of DP meter. Actually, it looks like I have one in here. Let me get rid of that just for grins. All right, so I'm going to put in two instances of DP meter. Just put one in, um, and I'll duplicate it. And then I'm going to take the second instance and put it on the other side of virtual tape machine. So I have this little bracketed pair of DP meters around virtual tape machines. And remember, this is a free plugin. I talked about this back in episode three or four. When I talked about the kinds of plugins you'll need. Um, there's no reason not to have this plugin because of this really nice feature I'm about to show you. So the first thing we want to do is flip. Um, we're looking at the first meter here. See the little orange button tells me this is what we're looking at. We're going to flip this over to its EBU mode. That's its LUFS mode. And we're going to open up the second DP meter after the vintage plugin. Get it over to the side where we can see it. And we're going to also switch it to EBU mode. Okay. And now what we're going to do is play the original signal with the vintage plugin turned off. See right now it's off. And we're just going to measure what is the current loudness of this signal? What is the current integrated loudness, the average loudness of this drum loop? So let's play it for a little bit. And you can see the average loudness has stabilized to about 12.3, right? So what you do is you, you measure with the first plugin in front of the vintage plugin. You measure with the first instance of DP meter and you take this value and you put it in the reference level over here, negative 12.3, okay? We want to remember that value because after we've done our processing with the virtual tape machine, we're going to want to get the signal back to the same exact original perceived loudness. Okay, that's the whole trick is you're using these two plugins to, 
take the signal down, and then bring it back right up where it was, even after processing. Okay, so now that we've done that, we're going to take this first instance and swap it back over to RMS mode because it sees RMS and peak measurements that are typically important to calibrating the signal down to the sweet spot level that the plugin expects. Now, with the Slate system, with this particular Slate plugin, I happen to know that negative 18 RMS is going to be hitting zero on the VU meter if the input and output controls inside here are at their neutral zero position, right? So this wants negative 18 RMS as its input sweet spot. Let's test that out. What I'm going to do is type in negative 18 here in the reference level in the first plugin. And now in RMS mode, we're going to measure it for a few minutes, well, a few seconds, and see what the integrated RMS is currently measuring. Okay, so the average RMS is 11, negative 11. That's quite a bit louder than negative 18. Now all we have to do to match our sweet spot level in the reference value here is you just click this little M button for match loudness. And when I do this, watch what happens to the gain value right here. Currently it's neutral, it's at zero. The minute I click this, it says let's take away 7 dB and that will make the measured integrated RMS match the reference level now. And sure enough, if we play it back, Okay, so, and you can see the signal. This is the post-processed signal. It's quite a bit smaller and quieter than the original signal coming in here. So now that we've dropped the input signal at this DP meter instance here, we've dropped this down to the sweet spot level and that's what's being fed into virtual tape machines. And we can watch the meters here and we'll see that the meters, if we turn them on, if we turn the plug-in on, I should say, you're gonna see that the needle popping right around zero on both of these meters. So we are in the sweet spot for this plugin, right? Drop your signal, raise your signal, do whatever you have to do so that these meters are hovering around zero and you are in the sweet spot for this particular plugin. And now it's gonna behave the way that you know, Fabrice Gabriel and, and Stephen Slate wanted it to behave. So now that we've got it, the signal dropped down to the sweet spot, the problem is it's a lot quieter to our ears than before. And we don't want to be reaching around for volume knobs in our, our headphones or monitors and turning things up just so we can hear this. And then if we play some other tracks, suddenly everything's way too loud. We kind of want to match this to where it was before, right? So what we need to do now, we drop the signal to push it into the tape machine. Now we need to raise the signal back up to its original loudness we started with. So remember we captured the original loudness value here in this second instance of DP meter right here. All we have to do now is play it one more time and then raise the integrated loudness to match this level again. In fact, I don't even have to play it. It's been measuring. I could just click this M button right now and it's gonna do 7.2 uh, additional gain to bring it back up where it was. Let's listen. And you'll notice that's pretty close to the gain we took it down in front of the tape machine. And the reason it's not exactly the same, the reason it's not negative 7.2 on, on this side and positive 7.2 on this, or negative seven on this side and positive seven on this side, is because this plugin's already having an effect. It's already changing the loudness of the original signal. It's, it's making it a little bit uh, uh, quieter. So we have to raise the gain up just a little more on the other side to get it back to the same perceived loudness it was before we started all this. So here we go. All right, so this is the effect right now of the tape machine on the signal. 
And you can see the shape looks different. We've got some slightly bigger peaks in a couple places. If we superimpose them on top of each other, you can see the differences. Uh, some, some parts of the signal are quieter, some are louder, and this is the effect of this tape saturation, right? But it is, right now, with no other changes, it's the same exact uh, perceived loudness as before, but it sounds different because, of course, we've applied this processing. Now, the important part is, it is apples to apples, the same loudness or same signal strength as it was before we dropped in this virtual tape machine and tried to squeeze everything down to the right level for the virtual tape machine and then push it back up to where it was before. And that's important if you have any other downstream uh, effects processing or devices. You know, you don't want to be radically changing the level that you were sending into them too. Like if I didn't have virtual tape machine at first, but I had done some other processing first with like EQs and this and that and the other thing, clippers, whatever. And then all of a sudden I say, you know, I wonder how this signal would sound if I put tape saturation on it. So you go grab this vintage plugin and drop it up earlier in the chain. And, you know, the problem is if you're not careful about making the signal be exactly the same loudness once you bring it out the other side, you just threw off and broke all your other processing because you're now pushing a smaller signal into them and everything's lower and now your mix is off because this track might be softer than before or louder than before. So you have to balance on both sides. This is part of gain staging and this is basic gain staging. It's got nothing to do with clip to zero. I don't have any clippers here yet and it wouldn't matter if I had clippers here. I would still do the same process either way, right? Okay, so that's the basic process. Let's show it to you with one other plugin just to show you how they're all a little different, right? So uh, rather than getting rid of these, what I'm gonna do is reset these values to zero all over the place, just to, or reset them to their defaults, I should say. And we'll flip this one back to EBU mode. And now we're gonna ignore virtual tape machine. And instead we're going to put them on either side of this 1176 compressor, okay? So right now the compressor's off. You always wanna start with your vintage plugin off while you take your original measurements, okay? So we're gonna play it again, get our, our loudness in the first instance of DP meter first. Okay, 12.3, so we come over here, we double click, we see a negative 12.3. Okay, so now we're ready to bring it back up to the same loudness when we're done messing with this thing, okay? All right, so what do we do? We flip this over to RMS mode. We uh, have to go read the manual and decide what should our sweet spot value be, okay? Well, this is, this is where things get weird because this is the worst manual in the world for one of the worst plugins. Well, I mean, it's a great sounding plugin, but geez, it's confusing to use unless you grew up on this thing. Um, way down in page nine, they never tell you directly what the sweet spot value is. They give you this number in DBVU, which has nothing to do with digital signal levels uh, up on like page three or something, and that totally leads you in the wrong direction. The whole clue to this particular uh, emulation of an 1176 is they say, look, we set this emulation up so that if you're using a ratio of four to one, then every peak that goes over 18 decibels full scale will start getting compressed. So the threshold for 4.1 is set to negative 18 dBFS. Now, where it gets confusing is if you pick a higher ratio, like 20 to 1, well, like a lot of classic compressors do, the higher the ratio, the higher the threshold inside the unit. Because it's not like digital stuff where you can see everything clearly and the GUI tells you and shows you everything that's going on. These are just black boxes. And you just have to know that for a lot of old analog compressors, greater the ratio you ask them to crunch the signal, the higher they internally move the threshold value, 
you have to push a louder signal into it to actually hit the threshold that starts squishing it at a heavy ratio, right? So at a 20 to 1 ratio, any signal that passes negative 12 peak will start, you know, getting compressed. So the threshold for 20 to 1 is negative 12. The threshold for a ratio of 4 to 1 is only negative 18. It's quieter by 6 dB. And then they don't even tell you what the in-between ratios of 8 and 12 are right? You're just going to have to guess at those. So scratch your head a little bit, think about it. What it boils down to is if we're going to use a gentle four to one ratio over here to start with, to see how, whether we even like this plugin, we like the way it sounds, right, on this signal. If we're going to start with a ratio of four, my magic number is negative 18 peak, not RMS peak. Okay, so for the tape machine, we set the RMS value to the sweet spot number. But here, our sweet spot number is negative 18, but we're going to be applying it to the peak. So we need to first measure the peak. And you also have to know that on this stupid plugin, the default sort of neutral gain input and output levels are 30. Don't ask me why. That's just how they set it up. The real unit, the real URA 1176, the neutral value is 24. So, you know, Waves, what the hell's going on with you guys? What are you, what are you smoking? Anyway, if you know this about this plugin, this particular attempt at making an 1176 sound, you set it up so it's kind of neutral. Make sure it's off. You have to dig through the manual to understand the sweet spot number and what you're going to apply it to. So we're going to measure this and see what the peak value is hitting with our current signal that's unchanged, right? The original drum loop. Okay, so peak you don't have to measure for very long because it you know comes up pretty quick. So currently it's super loud, it's almost at zero full scale. So what do we do? We click the M button here to drop it by 17 and a half dB so that it'll now be peaking at a reference level of negative 18 because that's what we want to hit you send the signal in at the right spot where this threshold's gonna start letting us you know, get the kind of gain reduction we want. So you're not going to see any changes here yet because this is off still. We're just looking at this number now. Okay, so look how quiet the signal is now. It's like you can't hear it. It's inaudible practically, right? And it's now hitting negative 18 peak. So what do we have to do before we start? Now we need to come over here and gain it back up again so we can hear it the same way it was before. Okay, so again, we're just going to click this button to uh, match the integrated loudness by gaining it back up again. And in this case, it is. It took it down by 17 and a half. And on this side, it's raising it up by 17 and a half. Okay, so. So now we hear it the same as before. It looks almost the same as before because this is still off. Well, it looks exactly the same as before because this is still off. So now. We're going to turn on the CLA-1176. And the way this one works is just, you know, you typically ignore the input and output meters. They don't help you much. You just care about the gain reduction meter. And what we want to do is we want to see this little needle start jumping in this direction as it does gain reduction. And the number that it moves to is the total amount of gain reduction on the signal. So I've got this currently set up to be at slowest attack. That's another thing that's confusing about 1176s. For whatever reason, a bigger number means a faster attack, and a lower number means the slowest attack, and it's the same for the release. So I've got a, a very slow attack and a relatively fast release because my goal is to shape this down and make a sharper transient and reduce the body tail of the kick. I'm shaping the kick, right? So we're gonna make it a little more triangle shape like a Dorito on its side. And at this particular exact gain staging, sweet spot coming into the unit, we're not gonna get any reaction because everything's neutral. This thing should stay completely still or maybe just move the tiniest, tiniest bit. Let's see what happens. Okay, see, it's basically staying still. Uh, what's wrong with this picture? This 
This should be louder. There we go. Sorry, I had to I had to apply the gain after the plugin was turned on because it's it's everything's been turned down coming into this. So now we're seeing the gain at the same level again. Sorry, I had to match this one more time. Um, okay. So now we're going to take their interior input knob and drive it up to get the amount of gain reduction we want. We're going to leave the output knob at neutral where it is now. Okay, now you'll notice the signal's getting audibly louder and the waveform's getting louder and we're clearly going over zero on this track now. And we're starting to hear probably some distortion that isn't part of the compressor plugin itself because we're starting at a level that's so close to zero full scale, right? This is almost at zero. If I turn on the zero lines, uh, we can only see that in the layered mode, right? All right let's pick the this one. So here was the original signal and it's right up close to zero. These two lines are zero. And of course, right now, we've just pushed it over zero by quite a bit. So we're hearing clipping. Uh, and we don't want to hear clipping. We're trying to hear what the compressor itself is supposed to sound like, right? So what you need to do at this point, because this vintage plugin is so fiddly and prissy, um, and it doesn't compensate, it doesn't do any kind of automatic gain compensation. It's just we're driving the signal louder into it. You, you might be tempted to reach for the output knob here and pull it down, but what I recommend instead is go over to the thing that's compensating on the other side of it, this one here, and pull the gain down here. Just manually pull it down to give you some headroom to work with at first. Now that's too much, so I'm gonna raise it up until I can hear it audibly. Put it about there, okay? So now I have headroom to play with these controls and dial in the response I want, dial in the kind of reshaping I want on this, right? I'm gonna give it a little more bit of um, compression to just carve a harder shape into this. Right, let's give it about six or seven dB of gain reduction, which gives us the characteristic um, curve of this kind of compression, right? We have a nice sharp little transient peak now that's really sharp and gives it an edge. And we've reduced the whole shape of this waveform quite a bit. I mean, that's the original waveform and that's the reshaped waveform. And if we layer them together, you can see how drastic the reshaping from the compressor is. And this is what compressors are good for. They don't control your peaks. The peak is even higher than before, honestly. Look at the yellow one. The transient peak is down here on the yellow one. Look where it goes on the blue one. It's actually higher than the yellow one, right? Coming up to there. And if we uh, layer them together, see it's actually higher, almost as high as some of the sinoid peaks that are over here. So, and this peak on this side is super high. It's all the way up. It's even overshooting zero at this point. So, you know, this is the sound we want it's definitely not controlling peaks. It's making the transient sharper. That's what compressors do, at least downward compression. They usually, you usually use it to reduce and minimize and shape the um, decay envelope, if you will, of the tail of a sound. And you usually use it to increase and sharpen the transients relative to the sustain. It's like a transient shaper, basically, just a different approach. And so this is, you know, a classic four to one kind of ratio, the kind of thing we might do with this to get an audible result. It's going to make the drums sound different. It's going to make these kicks feel different. Um, and so now we have the result we want, but now we need to volume match it back to where it was. We need to get it at the same perceived loudness as before. So now that we, you know, we manually pulled everything down even lower just to keep things, you know, from clipping too badly, and now we're just going to do the final step, remember, out of this thing. We're down here on step F. We've just finished adjusting the processing in the vintage plugin right here. 
So now we just need to come back to the second instance of DP meter one more time and click the M button on the integrated LUFs, right? So let's measure this for a second. Okay, that's evened out. It's just bouncing around between two little decimal values. So we click this button one time and now we should be seeing negative 12.3 integrated loudness again. All right, and now here's the fun thing. Because of what this particular kind of processing is doing, we just have some peaks that are now suddenly going over zero that weren't before. That's the original, all under zero, but now the reshaped thing because of the vintage plugin back at the same perceived loudness as before is over zero. So we got to clip these babies or limit them or something, right? So let's toss in a clipper. We'll do our, um, actually, let's just use my handy dandy rack. So we'll get our CTZ rack, bring it in here and open it up. And just to keep things simple, because I haven't talked about saturated track limit yet, we'll just continue using K-Clip for this. So the first thing we need to do inside the rack is, is um, well, we're going to ignore, we're, we're just going to clip these things at zero. So we're going to ignore the first DP meter part. I'm just going to come straight over here to the clipper, grab this. It's already set with a threshold at zero. It's already going to clip at zero. I'm not going to change this value at all. I'm just going to let it shave these peaks off right at zero, just doing what it does naturally, kind of like a bus clipper. So watch what happens to these peaks now. And now we're back to a signal that's staying under zero where it belongs. And now you're hearing the true effect of this particular type of compression and reshaping on this already loud squash drum signal. You're hearing it very differently, right? It sounds different and it sounds more aggressive because we've got this transient and we had to clip this transient a little bit. So let's set up a quick AB just so you can hear what the difference sounds like. We're gonna take these three things and uh, group them together into a single FX layer that I can turn on and off or that I can just mix between. Uh, we'll get rid of these other plugins just so they're not confusing you. And uh, all I'm going to do is just mix between the original dry signal without this thing and the uh, uh, affected signal that's being compressed with this vintage plugin. So here's the original signal. You'll see it looks exactly like, you know, the original SciScope Pro coming into this. It's exactly the same, right? Um, so this is the original sound. Okay, so whether you like that processing change or not is up to you. I personally don't like it. I don't think that drum needs this type of processing, but it, it just demonstrates, okay, if you're going to work with vintage plugins, you have to make it the same as before. So if you're going to drop the signal to get it to the right sweet spot, you have to do something on the other side to bring the signal back up where it was before so that the overall volume of that track or that bus is staying exactly the same in the context of your total mix. And that's it in a nutshell. So if you wanna hang on for one more quick demonstration, let's just show you this in a real project so you really get a feel for it. Okay, let's try this. So let's focus on this uh, rolling bass line, which sounds like this. Let's say, for example, you wondered what would happen if I put a, a tape saturator on that sound. 
So you might come over here to the track and, oh, I've already got a whole bunch of things on here. I've already got clipping on here. Am I actually clipping this sound already? Yep, I'm clipping it by a whopping 12 dB, right? So if you insert something like that tape saturator, let's say you decide you're going to do it way up front, uh, maybe between, you know, Spectre and Pro Q3, and I want to put in the tape saturator, right? The minute I put this in here, if I run the hot signal that's in here right now through the tape saturator, I'll just do this briefly, watch how the we're going to peg the VU meter, right? I mean, it's even got the big bright red lights telling you, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're feeding way too hot a signal into me. So again, how do we slot this into this processing chain but keep the whole mix sounding exactly the same? All right, so we go through the exercise. We drop in a DP meter. We flip it over to EBU mode. Make it a little smaller so I got some room. Let's duplicate it. Let's put the second instance on the other side. Let's do a quick measurement. I'm still looking at the first meter on the left side, the input side of virtual tape machines. And I'm gonna turn off virtual tape machines so it doesn't drive us crazy. So I'm seeing an average of 1.5 for the integrated loudness. So we're gonna open up the second DP meter and slide it over here. And we're gonna set this one to um, negative 1.5. That's how loud this signal is, all right? So we'll just leave that off to the side. Next, we have to um, get this input signal dropped down to the sweet spot, which is negative 18 RMS, all right? So we're gonna flip back over to RMS mode I'm going to set this value to negative 18. And then we're going to play for a minute. Okay, 1.7. We click the M button here to drop the gain by quite a bit. Now the RMS will be negative 18, and now it's safe to turn on the tape machine. So we'll turn this on, and you'll see that the meters are gonna be hitting around zero now. But of course it's quieter, because we've sliced it down by 16 full dB here, right? So over on this side, we need to turn it up. And how do we do that? We click this button here to grab and pump it up by a little bit less than the original amount of gain we took it down, right? Because this is doing things. This is changing the signal. Okay. So now we could play, now that we're hearing it again, and we're hearing it in the context of our whole mix, if I go on solo this again. Now I could do things like play with my tape speed, maybe use a, a tracking kind of sound instead of a mastering kind of sound. Maybe we'll use the bass the tape formulation that's a little bassier. I'll leave the bias where it is, so now it'll sound slightly different, slightly different color. It's a little rounder, it's a little warmer. You'll also notice that my loudness is louder because I, I made processing changes here, right? Every time you tweak this, you're changing, you know, the total gain with this kind of thing. So I'm gonna to need to balance this back to negative 1.5 again on this side. So we're gonna let it run for a minute and kind of settle out and then we'll click this match loudness one more time to get it back to 1.5. Okay, not too far off. Click this button. 
tiny little tweak, and now this should be reading 1.5, and it's going to be the same as before. Still not quite at 1.5. Sometimes I find with DP meter, you have to let it try twice. <laughs> Let's see if we, if we get there now. Okay, so did this change the sound in a way we like? Do we like the effect of this? Well, an easy way to test it, again, is to just group it. And then you can either toggle the group on and off, or you can just switch between fully dry, fully wet. But now I'm just, as a group, I'm just taking them completely out and hearing what it was like beforehand and hearing what it was like afterward. All right, so here it is before on the left side, and this is with the tape machine on the right side. Okay, let's see what it sounds like. Tiny bit creamier. It's a very subtle difference as this particular saturator wants to be, right? It's very subtle. It's kind of creamy, thickens it up a tiny, 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 tiny bit. Very, very subtle. Is it worth doing? I don't know. It's a lot of hassle, but your mileage may vary. You're the producer, right? But this is how you do it. And this is how we do it on a track. And it would be the same exact thing if I tried to do this at the bus level, right? I'm just going to delete this entire group and get rid of everything, put it back the way it was. Uh, let's say I wanted to do that for my drum bus, right? I want to fatten up my drum bus with some tape saturation. So I'm going to go all the way up to my drum bus where all my drum sounds are happening. Okay. So I've got my bus clipper, I've got a SciScope Pro meter, so there's no actual processing happening on this bus right now, right? So I will put everything in front of the clipper. So let's we'll start with virtual tape machines. Turn it off at first, bring in DP meter. Flip it over to EBU mode. Go ahead and duplicate it. Let's put the second duplicate on the other side of virtual tape machines and we're ready to play the same dance again, right? So here's my first one. Here's my second one over here. We'll just measure the signal real quick with virtual tape machines off. All right, so the drum bus is hitting about negative six lefts. So we come over here, double click, negative 6.7, I mean, or negative 6.6, .6, right? So now we're ready to bring it back up where it needs to be when we're done messing with this thing. So over here, we come and flip it to RMS. We remember our magic number is negative 18 RMS. So we set a reference value here. We measure the integrated RMS for a little bit. Okay, it's settled down, negative 5.4, click this, it sets the gain, so our RMS will now be negative 18. So now it's safe to turn on the vintage plugin, and here we go. But of course it's too quiet, because we dropped the gain down so much, so I mean our entire mix will be out of whack now if we don't do something to fix it. Here's what it would sound like now. It 
So clearly that won't do, right? So we come over here to our second instance and we just click the match button to bring it back up to the reference level we recorded before. And now everything will sound balanced. Let's see, we're using the mastering half inch tape. Let's make it a little bit bassier though. Let's go ahead and use the bassier tape formulation and let's kick the bias to high too, just to you know spice things up a bit. So because I made these changes, I'll probably have to readjust this integrated loudness one more time to get back to negative 6.6 .6 on this side. See, it's a little quieter than negative 6.6, .6, so I just click this one more time. And now we're hearing apples to apples the way it was before, and we can do a quick AB toggle on and off by grouping these. And now I'll just play with the mix knob again. That's how we do it in Bitwig, as opposed to just turning this on and off. Although you could toggle it on and off, I just do that. Um, so this will be without the tape machine, the way it was before with the entire drum bus sounding just the way it was when we first started. And then here's if we run the entire bus through the vintage plugin, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but to me, this kind of tape saturation sounds like hammered crap on the drum bus in this particular song. Sometimes, you know, this tape saturator is pretty well regarded. It sounds really sweet on a lot of things. It sounded good when it was over here on the rolling bass line riff, right? Doesn't sound so good on this bus. And there's a whole host of reasons why. It's not the problem. It's not that this is bad by any stretch. It's that in this particular mix, with these particular drum sounds, with their particular spectral characteristics, and the fact that they're already squeezed within an inch of their life on, on the clipping side, what I'll tell you is that under the covers, a saturator like this makes higher peaks than before. Uh, there's probably oversampling going on under the covers, which will always create higher peaks than the original signal. And so what's happening is when we run it through this, it's hitting the bus clipper harder. The bus clipper's doing more work. It's shaving off more peaks. And that new amount of extra clipped distortion is just kind of really drastically audible and changing the overall feel and balance of this drum bus. So this is, again, clip to zero. Clippers are on all the time, and any kind of processing you do, you can instantly hear whether or not it's going to work in the tight dynamic range you're trying to work in. If I were doing this the old school way with everything way down at negative 18 or negative 23 and all sorts of headroom, I wouldn't know that the extra transients being added on by this processor we're going to screw me by the time I got to the mastering stage because suddenly there's way more transients to be clipping down on the, on the entire drum bus. I wouldn't know that. It would sound great down at negative 18, but in a small mix with a small dynamic range, it's just going to start falling apart because it's creating peaks that are more than this bus clipper can handle without starting to make it sound a little bad. Right? Listen to it one more time. And we're also going to um, open up the clipper and we don't need this anymore let's actually look at the amount of clipping that's being done to this before and after okay so what i'm going to do is flip the mix over to zero and we're going to measure the original amount of clipping on this bus by double clicking this <laughs> so the bus is getting clipped 7.6 
If I now turn all the processing on from this tape saturator, my hunch is that there's going to be a bigger amount of clipping happening. Let's find out. I'm going to reset this by clicking it. Okay, so in this case, it wasn't that much more clipping. I'm surprised. I thought it would be a little bit more than that. It's only 3.3 dB more. That's almost nothing. Um, so it isn't really the clipping that's making it sound worse in this case. I think it's just this particular signal isn't finding it too flattering to have this particular type of saturation put on it. It's, it's favoring certain kinds of resonances and frequencies in the original mix. And I'm hearing this kind of sharper, flatter sounding, closed up, pinched thing happening. Watch when we flip it on and off. I hear it mostly on the snare in the context of the full mix. Let's solo it and see if it's a little more clear. Yeah. Yeah, the snare is more is slightly more relaxed sounding. It's slightly darker sounding and more relaxed when we're not applying this particular saturation. But for whatever reason, these settings just they're they're not flattering to the overall mix. The kick's about the same, the other elements are about the same, but that snare is bugging me. So again, your mileage may vary. You never know what's going to happen when you try some of these classic vintage processes like this. Sometimes they're magic and they make things sound amazing, right? Sometimes they're like, eh, I don't know. Actually, I don't like it, right? And you just won't know until you try, but this is how you try. And again, this would be the same whether you're in a, a really loudly gain stage clip to zero project or any other kind of project at any gain staging level. You should be bracketing and gain staging internally in, a, in your insert ch chains you should be handling the vintage plugins like this, or you're never really hearing what they're truly doing, right? You have to compare apples to apples. You always have to test all processing changes at the same perceived loudness, or you can't hear what they're doing. Because if it's just a little bit louder or just a little bit brighter, your brain's going to think it's better because that's the way our brains are hardwired. Louder and brighter is always better. Even if it's not, it fools you. So... You know, this is just the manual way and the controlled way to handle vintage plugins that are weird. And thank the gods <laughs> that there aren't many of these vintage plugins we have to deal with because they're such a pain in the ass. They really are. All the modern plugins, all the modern 32 bit float plugins, even the ones that are still 24 bit fixed, not as much headroom, you know, from six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years ago. They all sound so much better. They're so much easier to work with because you can run really hot signals into them and they're exactly the same as if you run a really quiet signal into them. All modern plugins are linear. Well, most of them, the vast majority of them are linear in their response. And if they're a weird plugin that isn't linear, they usually make that really clear to you and give you little indicator lights and stuff to help you find the right sweet spot for that plugin. But it's pretty rare to run into that. You know, 95% of the plugins I use, they don't care. You can run the hottest, dirtiest signals into them and they'll act exactly the same as if I ran a super quiet waveform you can barely see into them. Same exact response curve. So fortunately, we don't have to deal with this trick often. But if you do have vintage plugins and you like the sound of them and, or you just want to see what they're going to do in your mix, this is how you do it. All right. Thank you so much for hanging with me as always, and I'll see you next time.